Seeing the documentary series The Turkic World Continuation about the most significant, in our opinion, states the Golden Horde's successes, which played an important role in the geopolitics of Eurasia in 15th to 18th centuries. We move towards ourselves, recognizing ourselves in others. Uljas Suleymanov. The formation of the Kazan Khanate was the result of those processes of weakening the Golden Horde, which took place in the late 14th century, after strong military and foreign policy pressure on the Horde at first by its western neighbor, the Moscow state, and then in 1389-1395 by its eastern neighbor, Tamerlane's empire that completely defeated the Golden Horde and ruined its capital, Sarai Birke. The military defeat was aggravated by development of deep contradictions in the Horde at the turn of the 14th and 15th centuries, expressed in the fierce struggle for power between Toktamish on the one hand and the Khan of the Transvolga Horde, Timur Kutlu, supported by Siberian Khan Shadibek, on the other hand. After the death of Toktamish, the struggle between the heirs of these two dynastic branches became sharply aggravated. At first, Toktamish's sons took the throne of the Golden Horde, but they all didn't rule very long. The most notable of them was Jalal ad-Din, who ruled for the second time since 1411, for the first time in 1407, when he committed a coup by dethroning his rival Timur Kutlu Khan's son with the help of Lithuanian prince Vitautas. Jalal ad-Din managed to restore dominance of the Tatars over Russia and to make Vasily I Dmitrievich again pay tribute to the Golden Horde since 1412. Jalal ad-Din's son, Ulu Muhammad, who acceded to the throne for the fifth time in 1428, also supported the Horde's sovereignty over Russia. But in 1437, Kichi Muhammad, a grandson of Timur Kutlu Khan, Tohtamish's rival, became a Khan. Thus, the throne of the Golden Horde since then was finally closed to Tahtamish's descendants. However, Ulu Muhammad managed to negotiate with the new Khan of the Golden Horde to allocate him the peripheral western Ulus, the Crimean lands, where he moved, thereby becoming the founder of the new Crimean Khanate. But his stay in this new capacity in the Crimea was very short, as he at once didn't get along with the local feudal elite, Crimean mothers of pro-Turkish orientation, and therefore he was expelled by them from the Crimea in 1437. Atrophied by endless inter-sign war campaigns of Khans, Stepalusis turned into deserted areas. Endless wars caused demographic exhaustion of the Golden Horde. The number of Turk Mongols sharply decreased, and the Golden Horde, from a powerful state, turned into a country with sparsely populated territory. One of the reasons for dismantlement of the statehood was the abolition of the most important institution of national power, the Kurultai, at the end of the rule of Uzbek Khan. This led to weakening the order and legitimacy, national traditions and laws of Yasa. But even in such a difficult time for the state, princes and aristocrats didn't want together for a cruel tide to come up with solutions to save the state and its people.
Specifics of nomadic culture presume a reduction in possibility of accumulation. Culture itself is more plastic on the one hand. It can easily be moved geographically, it can easily respond to different political structures. But at the same time, accumulation, that is the power of the state, has a much weaker function. We cannot imagine that the capital all the time moved in a modern state. Similarly, the problem of nomadic union is to build, to accumulate resources and to equip some military arsenals. It was all personal. It was all formed directly in the clan. Against this background, naturally, under these conditions, there was a confrontation of all against all, absence of central authorities, when a group of people who opposed each other called themselves the executive authorities. And the legislative tradition, the Kuraltai, disappeared. The judicial power was in its infancy. They had already given up the trial according to Yasa, but at the same time, they didn't pass to either the Sharia law or any other legal procedure. This all disrupted productive forces. Against this background, we attach little importance to the exodus of people from the steppe. They didn't just die, and there were fewer children, but there was a real exodus, about which we learn from Russia's modern aristocratic books, when exactly at that time, due to instability of the situation in the steppe, In general, importance of Kazan is great. This is a place of meeting and rendezvous of two worlds. And so in it there are two beginnings, the Western and the Eastern, and you'll meet them at every intersection. Here, from unceasing action of each other, they shrank, became friends, and began to make something original in nature. Alexander Hessen. The main population of the Kazan Khanate were descendants of the ancient Bulgarians, old settled people of Turkic origin who long before emergence of the Kazan Khanate created in the middle of Volga region a state that carried on trade on a large scale and had long been familiar with the Muslim culture. The central region where Bulgarian people were concentrated was the area between the Volga, Kama and small Cheremshan river where the main Bulgarian cities Bulgar and Bilar were located. In 1361, Bulgar was destructed by Khan Bulat Timur, and due to this devastation, the population of the indigenous areas of the Bulgarian kingdom moved to the outskirts, mainly to the north side of the Kama, which was at that time covered by thick forests. The influx of the Tatars into the Kazan region was mentioned in Russian sources, which said that in 1438, in the middle Volga region, settled 3,000 Tatars, who had come from the Crimea with Ulu Muhammad Khan. Then to Kazan began to come many barbarians from different countries, from the Golden Horde, from Astrahan, from Azuev, and from the Crimea. Kazan, as a trade center, undoubtedly had a very mixed population. As for the mass of the agricultural settled population, we can hardly doubt that it basically preserved the old Bulgarian people. The Kazan state acted in the arena of historical life at once in the form of a mature organism, with a well-established domestic and cultural way of life. It absolutely didn't have the stage of gradual formation, and this phenomenon can be explained only by ancientness of its people and by the continuity of culture and race. Bulgars, the etymology of this word is very broad. It comes not since the second, but since the first millennium, when Han's descendants split. Part of them remained in the Caucasus, part left for the Black Sea region, Asparu, etc. They were the Bulgars, who colonized the population in the middle reaches of Itil, Volga. This is a tradition of the Bulgars, who adopted Islam in their time, in the 10th century. 
The Chuvashis are their direct descendants, but those Chuvashis chose a pagan worldview, pre-Muslim worldview. And the Bulgars, whose descendants are the Kazan Tatars, converted to Muslim belief, although from the genetic point of view. According to the gene pool, the Chuvashis and Tatars are the same people. According to the biomaterial, but according to the beliefs, the first are pagans and the second are Muslims. The Bulgarian state ceased to exist after Batu destroyed it in the 13th century. Speaking about events of the later time, Luke Muhammad's time, that is, the 15th century, we talk about which area, which land would be the base for claiming to Sarai. In principle, there was no question about any kind of extra Genghisid rule. The thing was that there was Genghisid, there were his Tatars, that is, the social category subjected to military service. The Tatars called themselves Bulgars, putting themselves in the most direct connections with this nation. Spassky. Essays on Native Studies, 1912. With the emergence of the new state formations and separation of the Eastern Lands, only the White Horde remained under the Golden Horde's rule. However, inside it there was a fierce struggle, which ultimately led to its dissolution. In 1425, in the hands of Colonel Lu Muhammad, elected in 1421, was a significant part of the White Horde Ulusses. But constitution was not fine. Because of the endless internal strife, the Turk-Mongol people went broke and left for Lithuania, Poland and the Moscow state. In addition, the plague epidemic in 1428-1429 swept off a huge number of people. But despite such a distressful situation, the state was relatively powerful, and Russian principalities remained its vessels. In 1431, Moscow princes, pretenders for the title of Grand Prince Dmitry Donskoy's son and grandson, came to Luk Muhammad's court. The Khan settled the contentious case in favor of the grandson, Vasily Vasilievich. The latter was enthroned in the Moscow Assumption Cathedral by the Khan's ambassador. Uluk Muhammad's government was independent and capable of influencing international politics. For example, in 1428-1429, an embassy was sent to Egypt. Meanwhile, from among Urus Khan's descendants emerged a new Khan, Kichi Muhammad, who claimed for the Western Ulusses, and this naturally was a great threat to Uluk Muhammad's rule. In this regard, there were especially strange relations between the latter and the Turkic-Mongol aristocracy in the Crimea, where there were supporters of the future Crimean Khan Haji Giri, who insistently defended independence of the Crimean Ulus from the Golden Horde's Hans. Colonel Luk Muhammad's situation in the Horde was unstable. Disagreements arose between him and his senior emir Navruz, Yedegei's son. Navruz left to Luk Muhammad and defected to his opponent Kichi Muhammad, becoming his senior emir. Not wishing to stay in inhospitable lands, Uluk Muhammad decided to go to Bulgar. On leaving Belev, Uluk Muhammad, passing Mordovian lands, approached the borders of Bulgar. After the defeat in 1361 and attacks of the Russians led by Prince Fyodor Piostri in 1432, the capital of the region, Bulgar city, lay in ruins, and its inhabitants, who had gone north beyond the Kama, into safer and more remote places, began to concentrate around the new center, Kazan. By the time Uluk Muhammad arrived in Kazan, it had already been ruled by Ali Bek, who independently controlled the entire Kazan region. With the prominence of Kazan, 
Bulgar lost its former importance. Stamping Khan's coins stopped there in 1422. Kazan, built by Batu Khan, later began to lay claims to be the successor to the Golden Horde's capital. In the spring of 1438, Uluq Muhammad captured Kazan. Kazan Bek Ali was killed defending the city. Formation of the Kazan Khanate began from this date. The Bulgarian state was flesh of flesh that became the Kazan Khanate. It was a powerful center of Muslim culture, a powerful urban center, a powerful trade center, and it has also a military tradition. Interestingly, the Kazanians fought on foot, and this was in principle atypical for nomads. Based on the heritage left by the Bulgarian state, the Kazan Khanate was actually formed very quickly. Everything wasn't even ready. No one prepared it. It existed, and the centrifugal force that tore it from the horde prevailed, and Luke Muhammad simply accepted formal citizenship of those people who were the centers of attraction of local people there. Weakness of the Kazan Khanate, with its potential and very serious power, was the fact that it failed to create a stable dynasty that could firmly retain power for a long time. The same thing happened in the Crimea. The dynasty of Gires, Genghisids, but precisely Gires, firmly retained power, and that enabled it to see out independence of Kazan for many centuries. And Kazan's throne turned into a prize for neighbors and domestic parties. They thought they were using neighbors to win at their place, but in fact, the neighbors used internal strife in order to predominate, and in the end, that led to the fall of Kazan. This city is undoubtedly the first in Russia after Moscow. It is clear in all that Kazan is the capital of the large kingdom. Catherine the Great. Having strengthened, Khan Uluq Muhammad decided to remind Moscow Prince Vasily about the Belev battle and the duties of a vessel in relation to his suzerain. At that time, he defeated a 40,000-strong Russian army. With this view, he undertook a campaign against the Russians. In the spring of 1439, Uluq Muhammad occupied Nizhny Novgorod and victoriously reached Moscow. The Grand Prince was forced to flee, entrusting defense of the capital to one of the boyars. After staying for about 10 days near Moscow, Plundering its neighborhood, Uluq Muhammad returned to Kazan. On the way back, he burnt Kolomna. For five years, the peace in Kazan had not been violated. All that time, Uluq Muhammad was engaged in creating his own state structures independent of Kichi Muhammad Khan. The Kazan Khanate, formed after dissolution of the Golden Horde, in its management structure, in many respects, copied it and didn't differ much from other Turkic Mongol states that had been separated from Juchi's Ulus. In contrast to the Nogai Horde, there were many cities in the Kazan Khanate. The Turk Mongols led settled lifestyle and were engaged in farming. The Kazan Khanate automatically included the peoples of the Volga region, the Mordovians, Chuvashis, Mari and Udmuts, who had lived in the Golden Horde. There were no changes in relationship with these peoples in the Kazan Khanate. On their lands there were no Turk-Mongol military garrisons and officials. Tolerance remained unchanged. 
These nations continued to quietly profess paganism. In 1444-1445, Khan Luke Muhammad undertook a second campaign against the Principality of Muscovy. After capturing Nizhny Novgorod, the Turkic Mongol army, under the leadership of Princes Mahmud and Yakub, entered Moscow region and reached Vladimir. In the general battle on July 7, 1445, in the vicinity of Suzdal, near the Sever Monastery of St. Euphymers, the Russians were defeated, and Grand Prince Vasily and his cousin Prince Mikhail Vereysky were captured by the Turk Mongols. They were taken to Nizhny Novgorod to Luk Muhammad. The old acquaintances met 14 years after Vasily Vasilievich came to Luk Muhammad in Sarai for an Yarlik to the reign. Grand Prince agreed with all terms that were put forward to him. He recognized himself as a vassal of the Khan and undertook to give a huge ransom for himself. According to one source, as much as he can give, according to others, 200,000 rubles. In 1445, for disobedience, Luke Muhammad sent a troop led by Kasim and Yakub, who completely defeated Prince Vasily's troops and forced him to pay tribute again. He tried to play on contradictions between Kasim dynasty and Crimean dynasty. That is, it was also so-called double tribute paying. For a while, they paid tribute to the both dynasties, because they had enough funds. They controlled the main dragging routes from the upper Volga to the Dvina and the Neva rivers, where duties could be collected, where cities Volokolamsk, Vishni Volochok, Vologda were located. These names are derived words from the word Volok, dragging. When Ivan III, Vasily's descendants, established himself in these places, there could be no question of any sovereignty of Ulus in the Principality of Moscow. Even Ivan the Terrible, only after the siege of Kazan, declared his politically independent ambitions and began to call himself a Tsar. Before that, he didn't call himself a Tsar, only a prince. But Genghisids were called Tsars. Uzbek Khan in Russian chronicles was called the Tsar, that is, ruler. But with him could be some princes, black bones, including Rurikids. Therefore, the point of issue was which area would be the base, the economic base for political ambitions. Muscovy Zaleska Horde was the base for Kasim's people. After some time, the situation changed. But if you talk about the situation in the early 15th century, in the mid 15th century, until rule of Peter the Great, until 1700, the Principality of Moscow paid tribute to Crimean Han. Kazan town is Moscow's corner. I heard this saying for the first time in 1847 at a post house in Simbirsk Governorate. Taras Shevchenko. When Grand Prince returned from captivity, a large number of the Turk Mongols and Kazan Khan's two sons, Kasim and Yakub, arrived in Moscow with him. The Turk Mongols were appointed to various administrative positions. At that time, they were allocated in Mishersky land on the Oka River, a special domain, so-called Kasim's Kingdom, given probably under the terms of the same peace treaty to Luk Muhammad's son, Prince Kasim. The Turk Mongols who came to Russia began to settle here as they liked and gradually began to build mosques in Russian cities. After returning from Nizhny Novgorod to Kazan, Colonel Luk Muhammad died. He had three sons, Mahmud, Kasim and Yakub. 
Kasim and Yakub stayed in Russia. Kasim became the Panage prince of Meshersky region on the Oka. After the death of Uluk Muhammad, his eldest son Mahmud acceded to the Khan's throne. When he was a prince, Mahmud took part in military campaigns of his father. He was the major commander in the famous Suzdal battle in 1445, when Grand Prince of Moscow Vasily was captured. With the death of Khan Uluk Muhammad, the Turk-Mongols' military power began to weaken. The military nobility turned into land aristocrats. Many of them engaged in trade. All this increased the desire to lead a peaceful lifestyle. The military spirit and ancestors' customs went into oblivion. Ivan the Terrible prepared for capturing Kazan very seriously. Four years before the campaign, there was founded an advanced outpost Siyarsk, around which a river flotilla was formed in order to prevent some raids. Inside Kazan itself, there was no unity. That is, some parties fought against others. Conditionally pro-Crimean parties were against conditionally pro-Moscow ones. From time to time they appealed to Moscow. In addition, the Nogai Horde was not united, and it was not in a unified front with the Kazan state. And there was no regular army. A regular army arose under Ivan the Terrible, who formed musketeer regiments with firearms. He had a magnificent cavalry, actually consisting of descendants from the Horde, and he was able to raise and maintain the army at any time. Not to collect his warriors to go somewhere at a convenient time for a raid, but in winter, summer and spring. They had supply bases, arsenals, the river flotilla. Naturally, against the background of such military superiority, the Kazan Khanate simply could not seriously expect the victory. Kazan town stands in blood. Kazanka river flows with blood. Small brooks cry bitter tears. In meadows, Meadows tall hair, on mountains, mountains tall heads, tall different heads. From the folk song. After numerous attacks and undermining with explosion of fortress walls on October 2, the Russians managed to break into the city. Hand-to-hand -hand fights began on the streets. The Turk-Mongols fiercely fought, nobody was going to surrender. All the streets were filled with dead people. A terrible massacre began, wounded and elderly were being killed, since the Russian command ordered to kill the whole male population. Only Khan Yadigar was left alive. The women were cruelly dealt with. The Tsar ordered to give them to his soldiers. The city had an odious image, fires burnt, Houses were looted, streets were filled with corpses, human blood reeled. Cultural values accumulated by whole generations were lost in Kazan. The book depositories and madrasas were destroyed and burnt. Thousands of books and cultural monuments of world significance were irretrievably lost. On the same day, Russian Tsar entered the fortress through Nurali gates and visited the Khan's palace. Only one street was hardly cleared from corpses so that Ivan IV could enter the city. 
the Kazan Khanate fiercely resisted six years after the fall of its capital. Seriousness of the resistance is evidenced by the fact that the Turk Mongols succeeded in destroying the entire Moscow army, headed by Boyar Boris Morozov, whom they captured and then killed. Finally, for a long time, Kazan became dependent on Russia. Its foreign policy and partly internal policy were controlled by Russian authorities. In its actions, the Moscow government was supported by its military force, which increased from year to year, and by pro-Russian representatives of the Turkic Mongol nobility. The struggle of various groups in Kazan and national contradictions weakened the Kazan Khanate.